Chapter 4 Kiss me, damn it, I implore him. But I can't move. I'm paralysed with a strange, unfamiliar need. Completely captivated by him. I'm staring at Christian Grey's mouth, mesmerised, and he's looking down at me. His gaze hooded, his eyes darkening, he's breathing harder than usual, and I've stopped breathing altogether. I'm in your arms. Kiss me, please. He closes his eyes, takes a deep breath, and gives me a small shake of his head, as if in answer to my silent question. When he opens his eyes again, it's with some new purpose, a steely resolve. Anastasia, you should steer clear of me. I'm not the man for you, he whispers. What? Where is this coming from? Surely I should be the judge of that. I frown and my head swims with rejection. Breathe, Anastasia, breathe. <clears throat> I'm going to stand you up and let you go, he says quietly, and he gently pushes me away. Adrenaline has spoke through my body from the near miss with the cyclist or the heady proximity of Christian, leaving me wired and weak. No. My psyche screams as he pulls away, leaving me bereft. He has his hands on my shoulders, holding me at arm's length, carefully watching my reactions. And the only thing I can think that I wanted to be kissed made it pretty damn obvious. And he didn't do it. He doesn't want me. He really doesn't want me. I have royally screwed up the coffee morning. I've got this. I breathe, finding my voice. Thank you, I mutter, awash with humiliation. How could I have misread the situation between us so utterly? I need to get away from him. For what, he frowns. He hasn't taken his hands off me. For saving me, I whisper. What idiot was riding the wrong way? I'm glad I was here. I shudder to think what could have happened to you. Do you want to come and sit down in the hotel for a moment? He releases me. His hands by his sides and I'm standing in front of him feeling like a fool. With a shake I clear my head. I just want to go. All my vague, unarticulated hopes have been dashed. He doesn't want me. What was I thinking? I scold myself. What would Christian Grey want with you? My subconscious mocks me. I wrap my arms around myself and turn to face the road and note with relief that the green man has appeared. I quickly make my way across, conscious that Grey is behind me. Outside the hotel I turn briefly to face him but cannot look him in the eye. Thanks for the tea and doing the photo shoot, I murmur. Anastasia, I, he stops and the anguish in his voice demands my attention. So I peer unwillingly up at him. His grey eyes are bleak as he runs his hand through his hair. He looks torn, frustrated, his expression stark. All his careful control has evaporated. What, Christian? I snap, irritably. After he says nothing, I just want to go. I need to take my fragile wounded pride away and somehow nurse it back to health. Good luck with your exams, he murmurs. Huh? This is why you look so desolate. This is the big send-off, just to wish me luck in my exams. Thanks. I can't disguise the sarcasm in my voice. Goodbye, Mr Grey. I turn on my head, vaguely amazed and I don't trip, and without giving him a second glance I disappear down the sidewalk toward the underground garage. Once underneath the dark cold concrete of the garage, with its bleak fluorescent light, I lean against the wall and put my head in my hands. What was I thinking? Unbidden and unwelcome tears pool in my eyes. Why am I crying? I sink to the ground, angry at myself for this senseless reaction. Drawing up my knees, I fold it on myself. I want to make myself as small as possible. Perhaps this nonsensical pain will be smaller and smaller 
the smaller I am. Placing my head on my knees, I let the irritation, tears fall, unrestrained. I am crying over the loss of something I never had. They're ridiculous. Mourning something that never was. My dashed hopes, my dashed dreams and my serried expectations. I have never been on the receiving end of rejection. Okay. So I was always one of the last to be picked for basketball or volleyball. But I understood that. Running and doing something else at the same time, like bouncing or throwing a ball, is not my thing. I am a serious liability in any sporting field. Romantically, though, I've never put myself out there. Ever a lifetime of insecurity. I'm too pale, too skinny, too scruffy, uncoordinated. My long list of faults goes on. So I have always been the one to rebuff any would-be admirers. There was that guy in my chemistry class who liked me. But no one has ever sparked my interest. No one except Christian Damn Gray. Maybe I should be kinder to the likes of Paul Clayton and Jose Rodriguez, though I'm sure neither of them has been found sobbing alone in dark places. Perhaps I just need a good cry. Stop, stop now, my subconscious is metaphorically screaming at me. Arms folded, leading on one leg and tapping her foot in frustration. Get in the car, go home, do your studying, forget about him. No. And stop all this self-pitying wallowing crap. I take a deep breath and stand up. Get it together still. I head for Kate's car, wiping the tears off my face, as I do. I will not think of him again. I can just chalk this incident up to experience and concentrate on my exams. Kate is sitting at the dining table with her laptop when I arrive. Her welcoming smile fades when she sees me. Hannah, what's wrong? Oh no, not the Catherine Kavanagh Inquisition. I shake my head in a back off no Kavanaugh way, but I might as well be dealing with a blind deaf mute. You've been crying. She has an exceptional gift for stating the damned obvious. What did that bastard do to you? She growls and her face, jeez. She's scary. Nothing, Kate. That's actually the problem. The thought brings a wry smile to my face. Then why have you been crying? You never cry, she says. Her voice softening. She stands, her green eyes brimming with concern. She puts her arms around me and hugs me. I need to say something just to get her to back off. I was nearly knocked over by a cyclist. It's the best that I can come up with, but it distracts her momentarily from him. Jeez, Hannah, are you okay? Were you hurt? She holds me at arm's length and does a quick visual check-up on me. No, Christian saved me, I whisper, but I was quite shaken. I'm not surprised. There was coffee. I know you ate coffee. I had tea. It was fine. Nothing to report, really. I don't know why he asked me. He likes you, Hannah. She drops her arms. Not anymore. I won't be seeing him again. Yes, I managed to say a matter of fact. Oh, damn it, she's intrigued. I head into the kitchen so that she can't see my face. Yet yeah, he's a little out of my league, Kate. I say as dryly as I can manage. What do you mean? Oh, Kate, it's obvious. I whirl around and face her and she stands in the kitchen doorway. Not to me, she says. Okay, he's got more money than you, but then he has more money than most people in America. Kate, he's... I shrug. Hannah, for heaven's sake, how many times do I have to tell you you're a total babe? She interrupts me. Oh no, she's off on a tirade again. Kate, please, I need to study. I cut her short. She frowns. Do you want to see the article? It's finished. Jose took some great pictures. Do I need a visual reminder of the beautiful Christian I don't want you grey? Sure. I magic a smile on my face and stroll over to the laptop. And there he is, staring at me in black and white. Staring at me and finding me. 
I pretend to read the article all the time, meeting his steady gag rays, searching the file tower for some clue as to why he's not the man for me. His own words, not mine. And it's suddenly, blindingly obvious. He's too gloriously good looking. We are poles apart and from two di- very different worlds. I have a vision of myself flowing too close to the sun and crashing and burning as a result. His words make sense. He's not the man for me. This is what he meant. And it makes his rejection easier to accept, almost. I can live with this, I understand. Very good, Kate, I manage. I'm going to study. I am not going to think about him again. I vow to myself, and opening my course notes, I start to read. It's only when I'm in bed trying to sleep that I allow my thoughts to drift through my strange morning. I keep coming back to the I don't do the girlfriend thing quote, and I'm angry that I didn't pounce on this information sooner. But I was in his arms, mentally begging him, with every fibre of my being to kiss me. He'd said it there and then, he didn't want me as a girlfriend. I turn onto my side, idly. I wonder if perhaps he's celibate. I close my eyes and begin to drift. Maybe he's saving himself. Well, not for you. My sleep sleepy subconscious has a final swipe at me before unleashing itself on my dreams. And that night I dream of grey eyes and leafy patterns in milk and I'm running through dark places with eerie strip lighting and I don't know if I'm running towards something or away from it. It's just not clear. I put my pen down, finished my final exam. It's over. A Cheshire cat grin spreads over my face. It's probably the first time all week that I've smiled. It's Friday and we shall be celebrating tonight. Really celebrating. I might even get drunk. I've never been drunk before. I glance across the hall at Kate and she's scribbling furiously. Five minutes to the finish. This is it. The end of my academic career. I shall never have to sit in rows of anxious, isolated students again. Inside, I'm doing graceful cartwheels around my head, knowing full well that's the only place I can do graceful cartwheels. Kate stops writing and puts her pen down. She glances across at me and I catch her. Chinese cat smile too. We head back to our apartment together in her Mercedes, refusing to discuss our final paper. Kate is more concerned about what she's going to wear to the bar this evening. I am busily fishing around in my purse for my keys. Hannah, there's a package for you. Kate is standing on the steps up to the front door holding a brown paper parcel. Hard, I haven't ordered anything from Amazon recently. Kate gives me the parcel and takes my keys to open the front door. It's addressed to Miss Anastasia Steele. There's no sender's address or name. Perhaps it's from my mum or Ray. It's probably from my folks. Open it. Kate is excited as she heads into the kitchen for our exams or finish her our champagne. I open the parcel and inside I find a half leather box containing three seemingly identical old cloth covered books in mint condition and a plain white card written on one side in black ink in neat cur- cursive handwriting is Why didn't you tell me there was danger? Why didn't you warn me? Ladies know what to guard against because they read novels that tell them of the tricks. I recognise the quote from Tess. I am stunned by the coincidence as I've just spent three hours writing about the novel of Thomas Hardy in my final examination. Perhaps there is no coincidence. Perhaps it's deliberate. I inspect the books closely. Three volumes of Tess of the Durbervals. I open the front cover of one of the books, written in a whole type of face on the front plate is London, Jack R. Holy shit, they are first editions. They must be worth a fortune, and I know immediately who sent them. Kate is at my shoulder, gazing at the books. She picks up the card. First editions, I whisper. 
No, Kate saw his all white and his sleeve. Grey. Why not? Can't think of anyone else. What does this card mean? I have no idea. I think it's a warning. Honestly, he keeps warning me off. I have no idea why. It's not like I'm beating his door down. I frown. I know you don't want to talk about him, Hannah, but he's seriously into you. Warnings or no. I have not let myself dwell on Christian Grey for the past week. Okay, so his grey eyes are still haunting my dreams, and I know it will be and take an eternity to expunge the feel of his arms around me and his wonderful fragrance from my brain. Why has he sent me this? He told me that I wasn't for him. I found one test first edition for sale in New York for $14,000, but yours look in much better condition. They must have cost more. Kate is consulting her good friend Google. This quote, Tess says it to her mother after Alex de Durbeville has had his wicked way with her. I know, muses Kate. What is he trying to say? I don't know and I don't care. I can't accept this from him. I'll send them back with an equally baffling quote from some obscure part of the book. A bit where Angel Claire says fuck off. Kate asks with a completely straight face. Yes, that bit, I giggle. I love Kate. She's loyal and supportive. I repack the books and leave them on the dining table. Kate hands me a glass of champagne. To the end of our exams and our new life in Seattle, she grins. To the end of our exams, new life in Seattle. And excellent results. We clink glasses and drink. The bar is loud and hectic, full of soon-to-be graduates out to get trashed. Josie joins us. He won't graduate for another year, but he's in the mood to party and gets us into the spirit of our newfound freedom by buying a picture of margaritas for us all. As I down my fifth glass, I know that this is not a good idea on top of the champagne. So what now, Hannah? Josie shouts at me over the noise. Kate and I are moving to Seattle. Kate's parents have bought a condo there for her. Dios mio, how the other half live, but you'll be back for my show. Of course, Joe say, I wouldn't miss it for the world. I smile and he puts his arms around my waist and pulls me close. It means a lot to me that you'll be there, Hannah, he whispers in my ear. Another margarita, Joe say, Louis Rodriguez, are you trying to get me drunk? Because I think it's working. I giggle. I think I'd better have a beer. I'll go get us a picture. More drink, Anna, Kate bellows. Kate has a constitution of an ox. She's got her arm draped over Levi, one of our fellow English students, and her usual photographer on the student newspaper. He's given up taking photos of the drunkenness that surrounds him. He only has eyes for Kate. She's all tiny camisole, tight jeans and high heels, hair pulled high with tendrils hanging down softly around her face. Her usual stunning self. Me, I'm more of a converse and t-shirt kind of girl, but I'm wearing my most flattering jeans. I move out of Josie's hold and get up from the table. Whoa, head spin. I have to grab the back of the chair. Tequila-based cocktails are not a good idea. I make my way to the bar and decide I should visit the bathroom while I am on my feet. Good thinking, Anna. I stagger off through the crowd. Of course, there's a line, but at least it's quiet and cool in the corridor. I reach for my cell phone to relieve the boredom of waiting. Hmm, who did I call last? Was it Jose? Before that, a number I don't recognise. Oh yes, Gray. I think this is his number. I giggle. I have no idea what the time is. Maybe I'll wake him. Perhaps he can tell me why he sent me those books and the cryptic message. If he wants me to stay away, he should leave me alone. I suppress a drunken grin and hit the call button. He answers on the second ring. Anastasia, he's surprised to hear from me. Well, frankly, I'm surprised to be calling him. Then my befuddled brain resists. How does he know it's me? 
Why did you send me the books? I sneer at him. Anastasia, are you okay? You sound strange. His voice is filled with concern. I'm not the strange one, you are. There, that told him. My courage fueled by alcohol. Anastasia, have you been drinking? What's it to you? I'm curious. Where are you? In a bar. Which bar? He sounds exasperated. A bar in Portland. How are you getting home? I'll find a way. This conversation is not going how I expected. Which bar are you in? Why did you send me the books, Christian? Anastasia, where are you? Tell me now. His tone is so, so dictatorial. He's an unusual control freak. I imagine him as an old-time movie director, wearing jumpers, holding an old-fashioned megaphone and a riding crop. The image makes me laugh out loud. You're so domineering, I giggle. And so, Hannah, so help me, where the fuck are you? Christian Grey is swearing at me. I giggle again. I'm in Portland. It's a long way from Seattle. Where in Portland? Good night, Christian. Hannah, I hang up. Ha. Forty didn't tell me about the books. I frown. Mission not accomplished. I am really quite drunk. My head swims uncomfortably as I shuffle with the line. Well, the objects of the exercise was to get drunk. I have succeeded. This is what it's like. Probably not an experience to be repeated. The line has moved and it's now my turn. I stare blankly at the poster on the back of the toilet door. That extols the virtues of safe sex. Holy crap. Did I just call Christian Grey? Shit. My phone rings and it makes me jump. I yelp in surprise. Hi, I bleat timidly on the phone. I hadn't recognised on this. I'm coming to get you, he says and hangs up. Only Christian Grey could sound so calm and so threatening at the same time. Holy crap, I pull my jeans up. My heart is thumping. Come and get me. Oh no, I'm going to be sick. No, I'm fine. Hang on, he's just messing with my head. I didn't tell him where I was. He can't find me here. Besides, it will take him hours to get here from Seattle, and he'll be long gone by then. I wash my hands and check my face in the mirror. I look flushed and slightly unfocused. Mm, tequila. I wait at the bar for what feels like an eternity for the pitcher of beer and eventually return to the table. You've been gone so long, Kate scolds me. Where were you? I was in line for the restroom. Jose and Levi are having some heated debate about our local baseball team. Jose pauses in his tirade to pour off us all beers, and I take a long sip. Kate, I think I'd better step outside and get some fresh air. Hannah, you are such a lightweight. I'll be five minutes. I make my way through the crowd again. I am beginning to feel nauseated. My head is spinning uncomfortably and I'm a little unsteady on my feet, more unsteady than usual. Drinking in the cool evening air in a parking lot makes me realise how drunk I am. My vision has been affected and I'm really seeing double of everything, like in old reruns of Tom and Jerry cartoons. I think I'm going to be sick. Why did I let myself get this messed up? Hannah, Jose has joined me. You okay? I think I've just had a bit too much to drink. I smile weakly at him. Me too, he murmurs, and his dark eyes are regarding me intently. Do you need a hand, he asks, and steps closer, putting his arms around me. Jose, I'm okay. I've got this. I try to push him away, rather feebly. Hannah, please, he whispers, and now he's holding me in on his arms, pulling me close. Jose, what are you doing? You know I like you, Hannah, please. He has one hand at the small of my back, holding me against him, the other at my chin, tipping back my head. Holy fuck, he's going to kiss me. No, Jose, stop, no. I push him, but he's a wall of hard muscle, and I cannot shift him. His hand is slipped into my hair, and he's holding my head in place. Please, Hannah. He whispers against my lips. His breath is soft and smells too sweet of margarita and beer. He gently trails kisses along my jaw, up to the side of my mouth. I feel panicky. 
drunk and out of control. The feeling is suffocating. Joe say, no, I plead. I don't want this. You are my friend and I think I'm going to throw up. I think the lady said no. A voice in the dark says quietly, holy shit, Christian Grey, he's here. How? Joe say, releases me. Grey, he says tearlessly. I glance anxiously up at Christian. He's glaring at Jose and he's furious. Crap, my stomach heaves and I double over. My body no longer able to tolerate the alcohol and I vomit spectacularly onto the ground.